Hello everybody, my name is Adam Manning. I'm here today to talk to you about the Chronicast Chronicles, which is an audio recording of the fabulous Doctor Who role-playing game from Cubicle 7. I'm the Games Master in the game, and my players are Dr. Squeak, who plays the mysterious traveller in space and time known only as the Doctor, Nicola, who plays uh, the nurse Orla from contemporary 21st century Earth, and also Stu, who plays a rather mysterious character known only as No Name. He's called that because he comes from a uh, space Connolly in the 22nd century, whose society is based entirely online in a virtual world. So he doesn't have a name in the way that we do. What he has instead is a big, big chunk of uh, computer code to identify him in his society. In the adventure, the Doctor had hoped to take his companions on a short holiday uh, uh, to the belt of Orion. But instead, he has, by mistake, by a complete accident, ended up in the latter half of the 16th century on Earth. And this is an adventure called The Northern Knights from Cubicle 7 for their uh, Doctor Who role-playing game. The Doctor, Orla and No Name quickly discover that the villagers around them have been stricken by a strange plague, unlike anything that they've seen before. They carry out their investigations and visit Waterbury Castle. And uh, the Doctor and Orla go in search of a mysterious body snatcher who has been haunting the village late at night, known only as the Collector. And there they make a horrifying discovery about what is really going on and the source of the plague. Meanwhile, No Name has uh, spent the night, tried to spend the night at Mortonbury Castle, only to discover that it's being ransacked by strange metallic rodents. Now listen on, ladies and gentlemen, to the Chronocast Chronicles, Chapter 4. Thank you. There's some form of alien software, some form of alien virtual living thing, living life form, has started to integrate itself into the, into the interface as well. So it's as if No Name's whole being is being attacked by cyber technology in, in, on two fronts as a result. So it's very worrying, in conclusion. Yep. So then, is that a request of what action I'm doing next? No, I'm just saying. Okay. Okay. Uh, in the meantime, while this has going, been going on, um, Robert comes back in with one of these creatures in his hands. Sir! And he sounds like a steam train. It does. Wow. It does. What was that? Uh, very rarely we get a steam train going through. Oh, yes. Yes, I heard about that. Yeah, they're doing the rounds today. So we, get, we do our own sound effects here. That <laughs> is the sound of uh, no, no names... Uh, Technology going haywire. Good luck. <laughs> Little steam comes out of his neck. Yeah. <laughs> we do not know what a steam train is. Yeah. <laughs> he, well, we do. No name puts the steam oh, in steampunk. Yeah. yeah. He really does. Yeah. Uh, that was awesome, no name. Thank you. Yeah, very right, uh, Extra points for his uh, sound effects. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. Good role playing there. Um, so, uh, yeah. Okay. So, uh, Roberts walked back in with one of these creatures in his hands and he says, uh, Sir, sir, I, I, I used. One of my concoctions. I found an elixir formed from quicksilver and also the uh, inner workings, the inner internal organs of a salamander. Mixed them together and set a match to it, boiled it up, and then used a flint to create an electric spark. And this was able to make this concoction that I then poured into this cyber. This, this he doesn't need the word. He doesn't know the word. Into this devilish creature. Uh, and this is the effect that it had. And, and what, what is effect? the effect? Yeah, it, we it, see? It's, it's effectively lifeless. It's, it's covered in this slimy substance is that Robert has pulled or, out. Or like of course, it reacts to the sulphur! Sorry, just a That's exclamation. Right. Make, do you want to make an ingenuity plus science roll, uh, Orla? Of course. It's trying to get David Tennant there. <laughs> Twelve. Although this isn't necessarily your field of um, expertise, your research into medical science indicates to you that somehow, purely, uh, you think by accident, he has hit upon a formula for a deeply corrosive liquid substance that has effectively poured out into this, onto the creature and rotted its internal circuitry. Ah. Somehow, using some of the elements that he's got in his, in his chests, he's hit upon exactly the right combination of things to deal with, with one of the, the creatures. We need to make this on mass. Yes. Uh, where did you obtain these ingredients? 
I have many travelling mendicants and apothecaries that I deal with from time to time, and I was able to purchase them. Uh, some of them are from the Indus Valley, I must say, um, and also from uh, the Iberian Peninsula as well, and even uh, from uh, Nippon as well. <laughs> I don't know why that's suddenly funny to my companion, Nippon. Uh, I would not know. I have no relation to the ants at all. Do you know it is said that there is a southern continent? You do know that the world is a globe, do you not? I am familiar, A yes. man of science such as yourself must know the, the very world. Of, uh, you, dear lady, will not know of this. But the world that we stand on is, in fact, a ball, a sphere, oh, n- nonetheless. Oh, wow. and it is not flat. It is not flat, not no. Not flat at all. No, oh. despite what you may hear, it is uh, not flat. Oh. No. Yeah, no, I think we've settled really. that science now. I think no one should dispute it. <laughs> Indeed. <laughs> <laughs> they but won. there are those that do. <laughs> yes, I've heard of such people. Such relatives of mine. Some, <laughs> some with a hair, but of straw. <laughs> <laughs> I met a man with a single eyebrow. How about that? Yeah, I met a few of those. Yes, it is true. Mm. Mm. Yes, but now I, I I tarry too long and I am vexed and perplexed, I must say, and now I must away to my bed, good sirs. I, I, I've seen so many miracles this evening, but none more than this. I hope I was of assistance to you in your quest, We must dear have sir. access to your apothecary. Well, um, yes, um... Mm, an interesting request from a lady such as yourself. Um, uh, I nearly was married once, you know. And that was a woman with one eyebrow. Mm. Yes. That one, well, I trust? Uh, mm-hmm. No, she walked out on me for my brother. Ah, really? Mm, interesting. Yes. Yes, he only had one leg. Aha. Uh-huh. So, yes. So she walked out with him, he hopped out with her, I would say. <laughs> <laughs> um, but uh, yes, such is life. But now I must, if you, if I may bid you a fond adieu and a good evening, uh, I my, this has been far too much for me. But I hope I have been able to show the skills that I can bring to bear. Yes, indeed. Uh, thank you very much for your assistance, and uh, maybe make up as much of the the uh, the. Elixir you have concocted here as you can. On the morrow, sir. On the morrow, if you don't mind. Do you have any for today that we could take? I used it all on this one thing, on this one creature, I must say. Okay, well... But what about your poor boy? (laughs) I told him to make more. (laughs) Oh, my jeez, you're so demanding. But you're a healer, sir. Heal your sick. Okay. I start working on the electronics in uh, the neck no. of no name, trying to uh, disrupt the signal against the new technology. Okay. Uh, all right. Make an ingenuity plus technology roll, please. Nine. Remember your story points. Fourteen. Yeah, I will use a story point. Thirty one. Oh, amazing success. You... <clears throat> Your, what you're able to do is that um, using, with the application of the sonic screwdriver, you are able to integrate into the circuitry of the interface, of, of No Name's interface, and your, the, the sonic screwdriver is able to relay back to you a lot of the data that No Name has been, has been absorbing. Um, while he's in this condition at the moment, his, the interface has been flooded with data from some alien source that you can't identify. It must be the Cybermen though. You you don't know it is, but it's all Cybermen data that he is downloading into Mm -hmm. the interface. And the imagery that you, that the Doctor and No Name have have been able to access as a result is extraordinary. What you're seeing is the imagery from the interior of a Cyberman scout ship. The scout ship is flying through space, through in point of fact, throwing through hyperspace. And the mission, and none of this is in words, but because you are one with the data, you know it straight away. The, the mission from the Cybermen was to fly to Luna, the Earth's moon. They were heading for the Earth's moon in the year 2069. 
And there were celebrations on the moon in that year for the 100th anniversary of the first ever moon landing. Very profound, very important celebrations. Very special, very serious, but also a lot of fun. Big celebration. One of the cornerstones of their civilization. And the Cyberman's plan... Like it signs up front, party at back. Exactly. Yeah. Uh, you have your ceremony, but then you also have your party. It's that sort of thing. It's a what? It's everybody. It's a fantastic celebration in the culture. Yeah, of you're telling me after they launched the Hadron Collider, they didn't get very drunk afterwards. I'm not buying it. Okay. So the Cybermen Scout Ship. The idea of sending the Cybermen Scout Ship is to assess Earth Earth system's vulnerability to uh, attack at that particular point in its history. That's all they were sent for. So they're making their way through hyperspace. Suddenly, there is this huge inrush of energy in hyperspace. It's, a gr- it's effectively like a great flare of energy uh, hurtling back through time. And the Doctor, you realise, can you make an Ingenuity plus um, knowledge roll, please? Okay. While you're assessing this data. Plus twice. 20. Yeah. You... Again, none of this is in words, but you're, because it, it, it's data in its most fundamental level, it's, it's like you become the data itself because you become so familiar with it. And you, you, uh, it becomes clear to you that this flare of energy washing through hyperspace backward in time is actually a, a, a surge of energy from the time war. This is something cascading back through history from a front in the time war, and it hits the Cyberman scout ship in hyperspace and sends the scout ship hurtling back into real space. And then it, and in doing so, it knocks it chronologically itself back through time. And so the scout ship is hurtling back from 2069 to 1570, 1575 and crashes into England. And uh, the, the ship is seriously damaged and the engines won't work. And the Cybermen instantly assess their situation as fatal and they have no chance of survival. But these are Cybermen, so they don't, they, you know, they don't sit back and just wait for things to happen. Even though they think they're doomed, they will do their very best to survive and not only survive, but thrive in the situation. So at that point, they start work on a plan to convert the whole of Earth at, in this period of time into a huge, effectively, cyber factory for the creation of Cybermen. They want to um, convert all of, to start off with, all of the population around them, and then that will feed through into a great power base for them to convert all of Earth's history, all of Earth's population, sorry, to Cybermen. But they know at the moment they are very weak. There's only two of them, and they know that they're very weak, and this is very dangerous for them. And that's at the moment that the data stops. The flood of data stops. No! Okay, so um, okay, but so that's the flood of data that you get from integrating yourself with the interface. But what have you got <laughs> for the benefit that's of uh, what that noise was, the, the, the benefit of Doctor Squeeze listener? He's uh, he's received a, uh, an Amazon Prime parcel that he looks very delighted with. Well, which Benny was trying to eat. I think he's excited as I am because I believe this is the book. Which contains a short story which I wrote. Oh my goodness! The first, uh, like these are pre-release copies. Sure. Of this way up, the anthology collection is coming soon. And they are very excited. Look at they the are. They are Let's loving go. this book. Be careful around Benny with the book. Should we take a break at that point, ladies and gentlemen? Let's take a break. Thank you very much. So, part the third, episode three. No name is still very uh, in pain, lying on the floor, um, dead to the world. You've interfaced with, with, you've connected to his interface and you've been able to download massive amounts of data that you've been able to see through the Sonic screwdriver and you've had access to it as well, no name. When in your unconscious state, you've been able to, to see all that data as well. Yeah, um, with the, what you're able to do with the Sonic screwdriver is, is stabilize his condition. So he's no longer, he's no longer, he's no longer going to get worse, he, but he's not going to get any better at the moment. I mean, he's sneezing a bit, but apart from that, he's fine. Yeah. It's <laughs> not only there by uh, Nicola. All, all, all those seem to be suffering as well, slightly. Oh, I'm empathic. I have empathy. You do, indeed. Absolutely. So, and your empathy is, is making it clear to you uh, that, uh, that no name is a great deal of pain at the moment. 
Ah, but I've had a pain injection, so I feel no pain. Okay. But, but empathy allows you to imagine his condition. Yes, but not feel it. No. <laughs> there we are. I feel for you now. <laughs> There's a discussion of empathy for you on your podcast. There you go. There you go. <laughs> You're looking around, um, and you remember that there was that upper level overlooking the, the council chamber. You can see a, a, a figure in the... Although it's very, it's, it's very dark, because it's the middle of the night. There's no electric lighting, obviously. Uh, there are a few candles and so forth, and there's the moonlight outside and an occasional flash of lightning. You're able to see a figure run past on the upper level. Oh, well, I will go, go after this figure. Okay, so you're clambering the stairs to, to go after it, after this particular figure. Uh, and when you walk up, um, make a coordination plus subterfuge roll. Oh, uh, 19. Wow. Okay, you you are able to sneak up the stairs. What's a wrong for your life? You're able to. That's not quite appropriate at this stage. As you do, you're able to stealthily pad up the stairs, and your the figure that you you that uh, you saw be- before, you're able to catch up with them, and you see that it is actually Doctor Field, Doctor Gabriel Field. He seems to be scarpering down the corridor at quite some speed, trying himself not to be noticed, and he's looking around rather furtively. Has he seen me? Nope. I choose to be stealthy and uh, just observe his movements. All right. You realise that he's going into somebody's bed cha- into somebody's chamber, not their bed chamber, but uh, a side chamber next to their bed chamber that they looks like it might be an office or something that they use as an office to write letters and things. Yeah. And he goes in. He has he has a, a bunch of keys on a on a on a ring. And he eventually he's able to select the correct one and open the door and go in. He closes the door after him. What do you do? I go to listen at the door. Okay. Um, I, being very dogged, like I just take a cup from inside my jacket. And <laughs> okay, I'm not going to make you spend a slurry room for that. Uh, make a. Well, I palmed it. It was a, 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 a flagon downstairs I palmed earlier. All right. Awareness plus survival roll, please. 16. Okay. You can hear some... You can hear him go, hmm, uh, hmm, yes, hmm. He, he's clearly a supporter of the Queen. He cle- the Queen of Scotland. He's clearly in league with Mary. There's no doubt about this. They want to overthrow the, Her Majesty. The vile imposters. The vile traitors. They will be caught. I will kill Mary. And then we will be done. And then England will be free of the papist plot and the Catholic scourge forever. That's all you hear. Meanwhile, back in the uh, back in the council's chamber. Um, so, uh, Orla, you're with No Name. No Name yeah. is passed out on the floor. What do, what do you do? I run to check how you are. Hmm. Okay. Uh, ingenuity plus medicine, please. Ooh, 17. You think, you realise that what might really be of assistance to him at the moment is a, a bit of a stimulant. If only you had something like caffeine or something. That, that... Ah, coffee! I shall go and find Robert. Okay, you go to Robert's Robert's bedchamber. You, one of the guards point, is able to point you to my lady, this way. And he's able to take you to Robert's... Uh, How do you Robert's... know where Robert's bedchamber is, guard? I'm the guard. I'm supposed to be guarding everybody. It's, it's you knew my, it so clearly and it's so my, quickly. My job, my lady. <laughs> like you've been there before. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, so what if I had? Uh, I don't question anything. Right, let's go get the coffee. <laughs> this is his. This is his bedchamber, my lady. I believe he slumbers at this hour. I will sneak in and I will take the coffee. Okay, make a coordination plus subterfuge roll, please. Just sneak away. Don't just ask him. <laughs> ah, just take it. Oh, but I've woken him up. A little tea leaf. I'm travelling time and space with. <laughs> Learn a lot about people, don't you, during these Yeah, days. yeah. So, sorry, coordination and... Subterfuge. Not so much about you, but... <laughs> <laughs> Uh, 13. Okay, the door's unlocked and you're able to go in 
using your utmost skill, you're able to walk in and look around without waking him. He's snoring on his bed very deeply. He's clearly in deep sleep. So uh, you're looking, you're looking around. So um, ingenuity, sorry, awareness plus survival, please. Uh, twelve. Uh, you open one of the uh, the large chests at the end of his bed, and there is a big pouch that you can smell is clearly full of coffee, very powerful coffee. Mm-hmm. I take the coffee. Okay. And also a fried egg. All right. <laughs> Do you even leave a note or anything? <laughs> no, just taking your stuff. Yeah. I, leave him, I leave him some alka seltzer just in case he's got another hangover. <laughs> Uh, and they're called exchange, I believe. So, okay, so you've walked out with a with a big pouch full of coffee. Mm-hmm. Fried egg, I'm guessing, dripping down the chin. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Not something for the trip. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> she wouldn't even wait until she was outside the door. Uh, like. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, you get peckish in the middle of the night. Uh, yeah, I gave him an alcohol salsa. <laughs> and, and she knows that Robert rather likes her as well. Yeah. Mm. Oh, does he? Oh, that's very kind of him. Mm. You, or, or at least you think he does. Not quite as much as the guard, I think. <laughs> the guard likes you too. Oh. Yeah, I know. Everybody loves me. So hard. There we are. Right. <laughs> <laughs> so what are you going to do? Right, I'm taking the coffee to No Name. Okay. So you've got a big pouch of dried coffee. What? You, uh, sorry, coffee beans. Yes. And what next? Right, so in my bag, I have water, mm-hmm. um, and I am going to boil the water, make the coffee, take it to No Name, and give him the coffee. Okay, make an ingenuity plus craft roll, please. It's not very easy to do this in the year 1575. Uh, I could boil it. I can, I can boil it on a pot. You could? 13. Okay, so you've made a big mug of coffee uh, in the year 1575. The guard at the south side says, What is that? I've never smelled anything like that before. What is that you got there? Oh, that smells good. Can I have some? Can I have some, my lady? (laughs) Go on, give us some. Yeah. We're still talking about the coffee I had. I hope this isn't. I really want it. (laughs) You can have it. (laughs) You've got to keep it for no name. I can give him a lady. Oh what my god, oh, I can't I can't drink that. There you go, right. What See goodness, you know, that's too strong for me. <coughs> See, he's happy, I'm happy. We're all happy, okay. and I can go. Okay. Okay. You made the young god happy, but okay. Alright. <laughs> so no name is, is now he's asleep on the on the floor. Yes. So uh over to you. Right, okay. I just lift his head and you have to drink it. <laughs> <laughs> okay, you sip down the coffee in great. Well, I say sip, you gulp down the coffee you know, without it being forced on you. Basically, this huge coffee mug of coffee. No. Uh, and again, like a lot of these things, you've never tasted anything quite as strong as this. And wow, you do feel instantly a lot better. And it brings you round straight out of your uh, out of your state of constant consciousness as well. Okay, uh, right. Doctor, what are you doing? Right, uh, so, oh, it's so glad that you've come back round, my young ward. You do feel a lot better. I feel a lot better. <laughs> right. <laughs> <laughs> That's all that out. Good. And it's thanks to me. Fortunately, I've had plotting. So, uh, <laughs> what was the guy's name? Uh, uh, Dr. Field. Dr. Field is, is uh, conspiring against the Queen. Oh. We need to sell the guards. Guards! Yes, sir. A bit audience with the Queen. I have some vital knowledge for her safety. The Queen is asleep, my lord. It is still... It is now five of the clock, my lord. It's a threat to her. She will not rise until seven at the earliest. And even that's difficult. Okay, who's she's, a late, chief? she's a late sleeper, my Who's her chief advisor? Mary Seton, her lady-in-waiting. Bring her me, me to her or her to me. The Lady Mary Seton... Or, or Seton, as I was saying earlier, or whatever. Uh, M- the Lady Mary Seton, sir, is uh, is is uh, 
well, she's very unwell, sir, if I can put it in those terms, with one of those, she's been bitten by one of those creatures. Uh, who at the moment is in charge of the Queen's safety? I think I am, sir. As, right. As the uh, guard. But I report to Sir Alaric Hansen, Captain of the Guard, sir, and a very dashing hero to us men as well. Ooh, Where is he? Hansen. Where is this han- handsome Hansen? Well, he's asleep as well, sir. It's five o'clock Wake at night. Oh, anyone might be waking up. <laughs> Your queen is in danger. He Wake him. It's a guy. He won't mind. Sir, with the greatest respect, <laughs> I don't take my orders from you. I take them from Sir Alaric. Get him, then. <laughs> he's asleep, sir. Wake him. Sir, may I suggest you go to sleep yourself? Okay. Just first of all, what's that over there? What? Yeah. The same mug I had in my hand from listening to Vice, I bash him round the head. To okay. Him. Make a strength plus fighting roll, please. Plus one for the mug. Strength <laughs> four. And then uh, plus fighting. Where's fighting? Uh, four. Eight. Plus um, ten. Sixteen. Okay. Yeah. So you. It works. Do you want to describe what happens? He thuds to the ground, but it's fine just knocked out. Okay, yeah. So he whirls around a bit and then thumps to the ground. Okay, out the window you can see this, this, there's a glimmer of uh, sunlight. It looks as though this, the sun is just about appearing over the eastern horizon. Okay, um, so yeah, so he's fallen to the ground. What about No Name? What are you doing? No Name is... Now that you're full of energy from, from this caffeine stimulant. I'm running around. Not running around, but like exploring. Like, what has just happened? Okay. It's oh, dodgy, isn't it? What's that? Let, 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 do it afterwards. afterwards. Let, let's okay. complete the mission we've sure. got. Sure. Uh, All right. Um, Ten so, minutes. you're looking around. You walk out towards the main gate of the castle, and um, you see that the guards are deeply alarmed at something. Go investigate with them. Okay. But you're going, sir, young sir, look! I think the castle is under siege. And as you look, you can see a long line of men on horseback, uh, along with some infantry, wielding uh, uh, bows and arrows and spears. And also, there seem to be some larger figures that looked encased in possibly armour from head to foot. Um, very odd-looking creatures, uh, One of the two of which are on horseback. But the horses look as though they're armoured as well, right at the back. And they're marching towards the castle. Meanwhile. Okay, I, I've gone to uh, wake the, uh, the head of the guards. <sighs> what? Uh, uh, Sir Alaric? Yes, what, what is it? What? Oh, my lady. Yes, yeah. how, how pleasant to see you. Enough of the flirting. Your queen's in danger. My queen? Queen Elizabeth? Well, the other one. Mary? Queen yes. of Scotland, you mean? Yes. Mary, Queen of Scots, is what I like to call her. She's in danger. What do you mean, man? Be truthful. Why do you wake me at this hour? Lord, uh... Could you... Why don't you leave us? Let, perhaps her ladyship could explain it to me. Of course. We need your help. We wish you to help us. I will help you. I will be of service to you, madam, in any way I may. We need the Queen to be woken. Now. For what? What reason? Because her safety is in danger. We need to see her. From whom? He, he gets up. He springs out of bed. Uh, naked. And uh, he's reaching for his weapon. <laughs> um, in choice of words. <laughs> it's in its scabbard and he pulls it out. Right, again. Wow. <laughs> Handsome by name? <laughs> Handsome by nature, little lady. How may I be of service to you? Put some trousers on. Or not. Let's go. All right, he's putting his long johns on. We must go now. We must go to the Queen's chambers now. Okay, as you're, you're walking out with, with Sir Hansen towards the Queen's Chambers, suddenly there's a trumpet blowing from the main gate. <laughs> the castle is under attack! Um, and no, no, while you're outside, the, the army is drawing nearer, and then to the front of the army, the two of the figures that are, uh, that are clad in this armour step forward, their horses come to the front of the army that's attacking, and uh, st- uh, stand forward. What do you do? Shout, what do you want? Yeah, I thought. Awesome. Why are you here? Do you want why are you here? Yeah. 
Um, uh, okay, uh, so you're shouting that out. One of the one of the one of the characters, um, one of the figures that's clad in armor, gallops towards the castle on horseback and uh, shouts out, "You must surrender! Surrender or be deleted!" What do you do? Where's the doctor at this point? They're they're in the they're, you're in the main chamber here. Sir Sir uh, Aldrich is who's just clad in his long johns at the moment with his rapier is um, running towards Mary running towards the bedchamber of Mary Queen of Scots. Oh, alarm! Alarm! Wake! Wake the castle! We are attacked. We are under attack. So it won't be that easy just to say <laughs> just to call the doctor out because he'll be in a different room, won't he? He's back Around in the outside. castle, and you're you're at the castle gate. This these figures are, are marching towards you. Um, this okay. The the so two figures. The, yeah, there are there are three guards next to you who are, who have been sort of walking a little bit forward to see if they can get a better look. Two of the figures are on horseback. As they get nearer, you can see that they are in completely encased in metal. It looks like a, a steel sheen covering them from head to foot. On their head, they have these handles that go from their ears over the top of their heads, their headpieces. Um, what the, the two horses that they're on, their heads are covered in metal and so is their chest area and also their hooves are covered in metal too. So, Stand down or be deleted. And then I, I would come back and say, um, no, I'm going to stand here and do nothing because like if they do nothing then I do nothing until one of us does something and nothing happens okay mm. one of the figures drops down off his horse and walks towards there's there's a, a man that if you remember the man with the big cap who was drinking cider from a big mug yesterday he's actually camped out <coughs> by the night by the castle walls taking shelter against the, by sleeping against the castle wall this figure is striding over to the towards that man who is out cold asleep on the ground Shout towards that man. Okay, just you try, shout. Just he, to try and wake him up. Okay, he comes around a bit like this. Uh, the figure, the metal figure, reaches down and with one hand picks the man up by, by, the, by the throat and then throws him against the castle wall. You hear a crack as his skull fractures on the castle wall and the man falls down dead. The other figure gets off his horse, starts walking <coughs> towards you, his arm outstretched. Meanwhile, back in the castle, Sir Alaric is, is, is saying, I need to wake the Baron. I need to wake the, the Lord Percival. We must wake. The, the castle is under attack. Man the cannons. You do that. I'm going out there. Good. Very good. Right. Okay. Meanwhile, outside, the, the metal figure is walking towards you, his arm raised. Fire leaps, rips out from a, a, a tube underneath its arm and engulfs the two guardsmen next to you. For a moment, you see their, their, their sort of bodies encased from head to foot in flame, and then they are completely disintegrated by the fire around them. Then it turns to you. Um, what do you two do? Okay, I'm going to... Um... One second, I'm going to call to uh, one of the horses. Benny, no! <laughs> Crocodile, no! What is Benny doing? He's nipping at his sister, the other horse. Benny! One second. Okay. You deal with the horses. Yes. All right, what are you doing? <laughs> Am I still with uh, Sir Hanson? You are. Hanson. Okay, we've got a couple ah. of minutes before we've got to... And we're under attack? Yep. Yeah. Why is Lord Hanson not fighting? He's trying to wake the Baron. <gasps> Ooh. Well, how is he waking the Baron? Going into his room, he shouts again and, and, get, and grabbing by the scrap of the neck and trying to wake him up. Do I have any coffee left? Yeah, you do. I will give the Baron, the Baron some coffee. A, a remarkably reviving beverage, I must say. Right. Uh, quick, man the cannons! Exactly, get up. Right. <laughs> I've run out to where uh, No Name is. Okay. And... Uh, I've got the side map, which I did keep hold of earlier. Sure. And I'm using the Sonic to reverse the polarity of the neutron flow to use it as a beacon. Okay. To send out the same signal to switch up uh, any cybernetics in the area, to at least totally stun them. Okay. All right. While you're doing that, one of the cannons belches a cannonball straight at one of the cybermen. 
The Cyberman turns super fast, faster than any human being to do, raises his arm like this, catches the cannonball in its hand, Whoa. bounces up and down for a second, and then flings it straight at the castle wall, smashing a hole in the castle wall. Meanwhile, the men behind them, uh, there's one particular man with grey hair who's, who's in uh, uh, chainmail armour, is riding towards the castle as well. He looks as though he's in charge of the human forces and the infantry are moving up as well. The, ar- the archers pull their bows, ready to fire. The side man next to you is pointing his arm at you with his cannon raised. And the one next to No Name as well is raising his arm, ready to fire at you. Ladies and gentlemen, and that's where we're going to call it to an end, just there. Oh! <laughs> just at that point. Thank you very much. And now we return you to our role-playing adventure. Okay, we're now getting ready to start the second session of D&D. Adam's just informed me we're on uh, episode four, but in the scheme of uh, how many episodes this has been in the podcast, I don't, I don't know at this date. None of them have come out yet, but here's over to Adam. Thank you, Dr. Squee. Welcome, ladies and gentlemen. This is episode four of Doctor Who and the Northern Knights, using the Doctor Who role-playing game from Cubicle 7. I'll set the scene. The Doctor had hoped to take you on holiday to the serene natural beauty of the Orion Nebula, famed for its healing properties and positive ions. Instead, the TARDIS has landed in a village in the late 16th century in England. It quickly became clear that many of the villagers had been suffering a debilitating plague. Visiting Lord Mortonbury at his castle, you discovered that the Cybermen had been infiltrating the village, but this was soon overtaken when the following morning an army from the north, led by two Cybermen and a noble named Lord Tristan Steele, attacked. You have just seen one of the Cybermen stop a cannibal with his hand while the other has flung an old man so hard against the wall of Mortonbury Castle that it fractured his skull, killing him. As you watch, the two Cybermen mount two steeds covered in large part by cyber metal. They train their weaponry on you and the castle behind you. Lord Hawksford, Tristan Steele, rides towards Mortonbury Castle. Now, what I want to say as well, just to be absolutely clear where you are, you and No Name are at the outer wall of Mortonbury Castle, near to the gatehouse. Yes. Uh, stood on the drawbridge with the armed the army of Lord Hawksford, Tristan Steele, in front of you, with the two side men on the tight cyber steeds in and, front. And when Adam says you, he means me. He, I mean you, the Doctor, yeah. and no name. Yes. Uh, the character only known as no name. He does actually have a name, but he's from the far future. And so, of course, instead of a name, what he really has is a uh, large computer string of characters and codes sure. and subroutines that but makes up the identity. name is no name. Is, yes, exactly, because he has no name. And we also have Orla. Orla is, meanwhile, is in Lord Mortonbury's house. Oh. Uh, it's around about 5.30 in the morning. It's a dull, overgrown day in August 1575. The inside of the house is absolute panic. Sir Aldrich, the, the knight who had been somewhat flirting with you at dinner, the, the evening beforehand sounds good is busy working with working with his troops with, with soldiers rousing his soldiers getting them ready to um, helping them to realise that they're under attack Lord Mortonbury himself has turned up still in his long johns um, he's a rather corpulent chap uh, of diminutive stature and he's huffing and puffing <coughs> what's going on here what's, what's this all about so what's all they're doing sorry you're, you're in the house at the moment, and there's a, there's a complete pandemonium and confusion and chaos with the attack of this army come uh, at the at the gate house. Mm-hmm. You're inside the house, and Sir Aldrich at the moment is is pointing this way and that, getting people to take up position in some of the towers at Mortonbury Castle. You do know that some of the soldiers are still very sick from the plague. Okay. Robert the Quack sidles up, wondering what on earth is going on. His hair is all akempt. Um, He's also still in his long johns, but what he does have is a big mug of steaming coffee, which he is sipping from. Ah, Nurse Orla, what, 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 goes, here? what goes on here? What, what is this pandemonium? What is this chaos? We are in chaos. We do not know, and it does not look like anyone knows what they are doing. 
Sir Aldrich is saying, We're attacked! The recusants are attacking! It's Lord Hawksford! Two arms, men! Two arms! Some of his men, you see, some of them, most of them are okay. Most of them are sort of reaching for swords and axes and things like that and spears. Some of them do look, have this kind of ghastly greenish tinged pallor to them, which is a sign of the plague. Mm. And Robert the Quack is quaffing his coffee. Mm. Yes. Mm-hmm. I'm going to take his coffee. What? <laughs> make a roll. Make a roll. Coordination plus subterfuge to take it out of his hands. Is it two two d six, please. Um, sorry, which is it again? Sorry. Coordination plus your subterfuge. That's what I love about D and D. You can be in one minute. Uh, Kind of trying to wrestle a mighty weapon out of someone's hand. Next minute, you're trying to spill some coffee. <laughs> and it's two dice, isn't it? Yes, it is. Okay, so I have got seven. You're able to nimbly pluck the mug of coffee from his hand. His his arms still outstretched. Outstretched. Going, what? What? Taking it from him. I have. I'm going to use the coffee. I can't remember what the coffee does. <laughs> to be honest with you, but I feel like I'm going to give it to the troops. Well, there's a there's a there's a soldier. Stood. He's wearing he's wearing a um, a, uh, a leather jerkin, and he's just trying to strap on a chainmail harness. He stood holding onto a spear with one hand. He's distinctly got a greenish tinge to his skin. I'm giving him some of the coffee. Is is this a potion, milady? It is. You have the healing arts, do you not? I do. Are you advising me to take this thing? Yes, am absolutely. I, am I supposed to trust a beautiful woman like you? Not on most occasions, but today, yes. Well, damn the hatch, I say. <laughs> I could be dead by sunset. Oh, 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 oh. Ah. Well, that certainly puts a bit of vim in your vigour. I'm ready for anything now. Thank you, Mom. Off you go. And he hands it back. Thank you. Robert the Quack is coming over. Dude, what, 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 what's going on? Wait, you've taken my coffee. I've hardly got any of this coffee left. We will take all your coffee because we need it for the troops. Who says? I say. Right. Meanwhile, back back at the gay house. What about what about the doctor? Okay. So I believe we are under attack at the time. Yes. There's there's um, the two side two the two side men on their cyber steeds. Uh, they stood directly opposing the gatehouse. Are these literally side men horses? They are not. They look at their they they're normal horses, well built horses. Their hooves and their upper body and their heads and their hindquarters are covered in armour that, that looks as though it's, it's, it's got that plated effect of cyber metal, cyber steel. Ah. So you know the kind of corrugated effect that cybermen have on their bodies. It's, it's that sort of look. I love it. Their, their eyes are glowing red. And every now and then, every now and then when they um, breathe out, there's a bit of... Uh... <laughs> <laughs> no, no. And it's cracking. Wow. There's a, there's a bit of bit of mist come, coming out of the nostrils. Now, what really can't be appreciated at home is how skillfully Adam did that noise, just using his own vocal cords. <laughs> it's a little trick that I have. Yeah. So, you know. <laughs> okay. Uh, to pull on a trick which I believe I played last time, I'm going to pull out my sun screwdriver, use it uh, to enhance uh, some, some of the cybernetic powers within No Name. Yeah. To boost the signal. Okay. Try and use that to disrupt the signal to cyber horses. To what effect? To incapacitate them and thus the, you know, uh, so the cybermen are upon the, the horses, yeah? Yes, they are. So basically to stop the cybernetics working on them, to spook the horses effectively and, uh, you know, have them. Okay. Roll up their riders. All right. Roll for ingenuity plus technology plus two for using some of a screwdriver. Fourteen. Plus okay. This is going to be pretty 15, tricky. 16. Remember, you've got story points that you can spend as well. Yep, I'm going to do one of those. Okay, right. So add on an extra two dice. 16 plus 22. Okay, right. You're wielding your sonic screwdriver, and as you do so, you're able to tune in to the exact frequency that keeps the horse's cyber steel armor plating in a in a coherent and functioning unit on the on the horse, and you're able to disrupt the links in the in between those plates of the cyber steel, and that starts sending out an electric jolt, and that has the effect of really scaring the horse. So the the plating is coming away in this fashion. 
The horse, there we go again. The horse rears up behind it, and the side man is, is desperately trying to hang on. Oh, the, the horses have started barking so, with uh, anguish. Well, no, there's, there's some. The, the Lord Mortonbury has has some good sized hounds that he keeps as part of his army. Well, of course. Part of the army, part of his forces, absolutely. Side men don't make the, the best of riders, and what, although one of them is able to hold on, the other one gets flung off his horse and is lying on its back in the dust uh, near on their side uh, uh, facing Mortonbury Castle. You've managed to get him off his steed as a result. Excellent. While this is going on, a tall, silver-haired man in elaborate robing uh, and plate armour is riding up to the castle. Um, he's holding a pennant. Um, with a with a, a, an elaborate H in green uh, tapestry tapestry like ink on the uh, on, on the material of the flag. Ah, is this the penitent man that the uh, the Indiana Jones spoke of? Wow! <laughs> <laughs> your your reference is completely lost on those around you. Ah ah ah! So the doctor. Who is this man? <laughs> he's, a, he's a nutter. You know, and his dad Henry. No one's seen that film. Oh, it's a classic. My favourite of the trilogy. <laughs> 